Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Ubrelvi. Ubrelvi is a new drug just approved by the Food and Drug Administration in December of 2019. The drug is for the treatment of acute migraine headaches, either with or without aura. It's not for prevention of the migraines, but it's for treatment of the migraines, and it's the first drug in its family. The family is known as Gepant, G-E-P-A-N-T. This is a drug that works as a CGRP receptor antagonist. Now what that means is that there's a chemical that floats around in the system and it's known as CGRP, calcitonin gene related peptide. And that chemical has to dock somewhere and the docking site is the receptor. That's on the outside of the cell. So the drug, Ubrelvi, blocks the CGRP receptor and it antagonizes the interaction of the two. So that's how it works. This is an oral medicine as opposed to the other medicines that work on the CGRP at the present time that are for prevention of migraine headaches, not treatment of acute headaches, but prevention, and those are injectable. Well, how do you take the drug? It comes in two forms, 50 milligram or 100 milligram. Take it with or without food, by mouth, of course. If you find that you don't have sufficient relief after two hours, you may take a second dose, second dose of 50 or 100 milligrams. Maximum dose in the 24-hour time period should be 200 milligrams. And the safety of using the drug for more than eight migraine headaches in a month has not yet been established. You don't have to change the dose on the basis of either age or sex or race or weight. If your liver is not up to par, then that might be an issue. If you have mild or moderate liver impairment, that's okay. Don't have to worry about the dose. But if you have severe liver impairment, then you should probably take no more than 50 milligrams initially and 50 milligrams if necessary two hours later. On the other hand, same sort of deal with uh, kidneys. If you have significant kidney disease, then limit the amount of the drug that you take 50 milligrams initially and 50 milligrams two hours or later if necessary. If you have end-stage renal disease, it's not recommended that you take the medicine and that's on the abundance of caution, not because we know that it does anything bad. Side effects of the medicine, mm, it doesn't really seem to have a lot of side effects and they don't seem to be very significant. A little nausea or some sleepiness, somnolence, dry mouth, and maybe two, three percent of the people. Fortunately, medicine does not seem to cause arrhythmias, doesn't seem to interact with the electrocardiogram, so that's all good. But the caveat is that the drug hasn't been around for too long, so the data on treating people for more than a year, it's less than 400 people, and the average was only about two migraine headaches per month in the people who were using it long term. So we don't know what's going to be the story a year or two years down the road when people have been taking the medicine, have other kind of medical issues, and are taking other kind of drugs. Now, it's important to realize that the CGRP is important in migraine headaches, and we have some medicines already that supposedly act as preventives. Those are the medicines like Amavig, Adjuvi or Mgality. And you can see shows that we've done on those kind of medicines. This is a different sort of medicine, but it still works on the same basic CGRP. It's a receptor antagonist, however. Well, CGRP is an important kind of chemical as far as migraines. It's a vasodilator. It's a pain signaling neurotransmitter. It seems to have a lot of activity in the trigeminal ganglion and nerves and glial cells, but it's widely distributed throughout the central nervous system and the cerebellum and the cerebral hemispheres and the brain stem, spinal cord, peripheral nervous system. It even seems to be involved in appetite suppression and gastric acid secretion and maybe the heart rate control. It seems that in people who have migraine headaches, the level of CGRP goes up in the system. If we take some CGRP and inject it into people who are susceptible to migraine headaches, they'll get a migraine headache. But if they're not susceptible to migraines, then they don't seem to have any problem with the chemical. Well, 
if you take the drug, how long does it take to get into the system? Because speed is of the essence, of course, in migraine headache. It takes about an hour and a half to reach the peak concentration in the plasma. But if you take it with food, especially with fatty meal, you could delay that to about two hours, decrease the maximum concentration in the system by about 25%. But the company says you could take it either with or without food. That shouldn't be an issue but just realize that it might decrease slightly the amount in the system. The protein binding is about 90%. It's going to be eliminated by an enzyme in the liver, a drug metabolizing enzyme known as 3A4. That seems to have something to do with the metabolism, but we do know that a significant amount of the drug is going to be excreted unchanged, not metabolized. So actually, if we look at the half-life of the drug, it's going to be about five to seven hours. If you look at the excretion, it's going to be mostly through the fecal route, a little bit through the kidneys. Actually, more than 40% is going to go out in the feces without any change. It's going out just the same way it went in. If we look at the urine, about 6% is going to be passed unchanged. Good news is, it doesn't seem to cause cancer. It's not carcinogenic. It doesn't cause mutations in the cells, not mutagenic. And it doesn't seem to impair fertility, but it does interact with some other chemicals you might be taking, other drugs you might be taking, that alter those enzymes in the liver, the 3A4. So if you're taking drugs that strongly inhibit the ability of the 3A4 to do its job, that would be taking clarithromycin or ketoconazole or itraconazole, going to result in a peak plasma concentration of five-fold more than normal. So that's not good. So that means you shouldn't take the drug. Shouldn't take Ubrelvi if you happen to be taking the clarithromycin or the ketoconazole, drugs like that. Moderate inhibitors of 3A4, drugs like Cipro or Fluconazole or Verapamil, even grapefruit juice, going to increase the concentration by about threefold. So that means you should reduce your initial dose to 50 milligrams and you shouldn't take a second dose within the 24 hour time period. Taking a weak inhibitor, well, you can take 50 milligrams initially and 50 milligrams after more than two hours if necessary. On the other hand, you could take drugs that stimulate the activity of the 3A4. We call them inducers. So if you're taking a drug like rifampin or dilantin or St. John's wort, that's going to decrease the amount of ubrelvi in the system by about 80%. So don't take the ubrelvi, it ain't going to work. On the other hand, if you're taking a moderate or a weak inducer of the drug, it's going to decrease the ubrelvi by about 50% in the system, so it's probably prudent to take 100 milligrams initially and 100 milligrams if necessary after two hours. Now, there's some other kind of chemicals in the system that might interact with drugs. So if you take carvedilol or quinidine or curcumin, that might actually need to cause a dose modification. So just take 50 milligrams initially and 50 milligrams after two hours or more if necessary. But you don't have to worry about a birth control pill or acetaminophen or naproxen or sumatriptan or nexium. Some laboratory studies show that it might not be a great idea to take it in pregnancy. We know from animal models that it can increase the mortality in the embryos and the fetuses and rabbits decrease the offspring weight in rabbits, really hasn't been studied pregnant women, but we know that migraine doesn't seem to be associated with an increased incidence of birth defects or miscarriages by itself, the migraines. Don't know about what happens with the uh, ubrelvi, lactation, again, the same story. It appears in animal milk, but we don't know about human milk. Don't even know what it would do to the breastfed infant or what it would do to the production of the breast milk. Hasn't been studied in pediatric population. In geriatric population, senior citizens, hasn't been studied specifically, but there's no apparent difference between people who are over age 65 or under age 65. Overdose, not an issue doesn't seem to be a toxic medicine and chances are you're not going to have enough of it to do you any harm. Studies have been done looking at how Ubrelvi works compared to placebo. But the studies only looked at treating one migraine headache in the person. 
so not in a series of migraine headaches. So we don't know how it would work on a second or a third or a fourth migraine. And it has not been compared to other active drugs, so it hasn't compared to aspirin or the tryptans. And it's certainly not been tested on other drugs that interact with the uh, CGRP. So, looking at studies. They did a couple studies. One looked at placebo versus 50 milligrams versus 100 milligrams of Ubrelvi. The other looked at 25 milligrams versus 50 milligrams versus uh, placebo. People who were involved had headaches of moderate intensity 60% of the time, severe intensity 40% of the time, the average age was about 40, ranged anywhere between 18 and 75, with or without an aura. People were supposed to have between two and eight migraine headaches every month in order to qualify for the study, and the migraines had to last anywhere between four and 72 hours if they didn't have any treatment. 90% of the people were white, 90% of the people were women. They were excluded from the study if they had more than 15 headache days a month, on average, if they had chronic migraine, or if they took other drugs that would interact with the CGRP, so the Amavig, the Ajavi, or the Emgality. So the first study looked at placebo, 50 milligram, 100 milligram of Ubrelvi, and what they found was that with placebo at two hours, pain-free, 12% basically. With the Ubrelvi, 50 or 100 milligram, 20%. So we go from 12% pain-free at two hours with placebo to about 20% pain-free with Ubrelvi, either 50 milligram or 100 milligram. Here's a graphic representation. The blue, pain-free. The orange, not pain-free top with placebo, bottom with Ubrelvi. You can see that the patients, when asked, were they free of the most bothersome symptom? And the most bothersome symptom were either the photophobia, the phonophobia, or nausea. Photophobia is abnormal discomfort from the light. Phonophobia, abnormal discomfort from the sound. Well, in the placebo group, about 30%, just under 30%, were free of the most bothersome symptom. In the Ubrelvi group, whether it was 50 or the 100 milligram, about a little less than 40% free of the symptom. Now, if we look at pain relief, pain relief at two hours, so we go from moderate to severe intensity to mild or no pain at two hours, 50% in the placebo group, 60% in the Ubrelvi group. And if we look at sustained pain freedom, between two and 24 hours later. So you take the medicine, and after two hours, you're pain-free, and you stay pain-free for the entire day. 9% in the Ubrelvi group, in the, in the placebo group, 9% in the placebo group. In the group receiving the Ubrelvi, 50 milligrams, the percent pain-free was not statistically significantly different from the placebo group, it was about 13%. In the people receiving the 100 milligram Ubrelvi, it was statistically significantly different, but it was only 15%. So here's a graphic representation of that. The blue, the people who were sustained pain-free between two and 24 hours, taking the Ubrelvi. The blue, pain-free. The orange, not pain-free. About 40% of the people required a second dose. And remember, the drug was only evaluated in one migraine attack, not repeated attacks, no active comparators. And the group that was involved, remember they were supposed to have somewhere between two and eight migraine headaches a month? Well, 20% of the people who were studied didn't even have any migraine headaches in the two months of the study. So the study, two groups, one group published in the New England Journal of Medicine in December of 2019, the other in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, in November of 2019. They looked in the New England Journal study, 50, 100 milligram versus placebo in the JAMA article, 25 milligram, 50 milligram placebo. Now, we like in drug studies, 
we like people who are involved somehow in the drug or the manufacturer or some financial interest not to be involved in the studies. It's kind of like if we want a legitimate reference, you don't ask your best friend. Because if you ask your best friend, you're going to have some bias versus just somebody you pick off the street. Well, the sponsor of this study happened to develop the trial protocol in combination with the external consultants. They provided the drug and the placebo, they gathered the data, they analyzed the data, and they prepared the manuscript. They also hastened the drug through the Food and Drug Administration. New drug application in December of 2018, approval in December of 2019. That was extraordinarily fast. That's because of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act passed by Congress that allows the manufacturer to pay the Food and Drug Administration to go and look at the drug and approve the drug. Well, if we look at those two papers, the paper in the New England Journal and the paper in JAMA, you would think of all of the neurologists in the country or in the world that they would have a choice of picking a different group. But basically, the same authors were on both papers. And again, we don't like doctors to have conflicts of interest. So if you're getting money from a company for one reason or another, there might be, might be, the chance that it could somehow change your evaluation. So we like no conflicts of interest. And as a result, the major journals require doctors to list any potential conflict of interest. And I was just struck at the conflicts that the New England Journal of Medicine listed for the lead author of its reports, happened to be the second author of the JAMA report, Dr. Dodit. And here are his potential conflicts of interest, and you see that they're actually quite significant and numerous. Now that doesn't say anything about whether his opinion was biased or not biased, but it just says that as far as conflicts of interest are concerned, we're getting a little skeptical. It makes us a little bit nervous. Now, as far as treatment for migraine headaches concerned, we have aspirin and acetaminophen. We have the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the triptens. We have the ergot preparations. Now we have the CGRP receptor antagonists. And then we have the opioids. The opioids are sort of out of fashion because of the addiction. We have side effects that are possible with the non-steroidals and with the aspirin that could upset your stomach. The triptens might cause some cardiovascular risk. So if a person has had a heart attack, maybe it's not a good drug to take. The triptens, on the other hand, are the most commonly used drugs. They're mostly available in generic drug. So you could use the Axert, the Relpax, the Frova. You could use the Amerge. You could use Maxalt or Imitrex. That's also Sumatriptan or Zomig. They work on serotonin. That's completely different than the CGRP work on people who have moderate to severe migraines. And if we look at the percent pain-free at two hours after they use a tryptin, it can be anywhere between 12% and 40%. And if a person doesn't respond to one of the tryptins, say they don't respond to the Imitrex, well, they might respond to the Maxol. So you can switch between the different drugs. But the tryptins might cause some kind of uh, an increased cardiovascular issue if a person's at risk. So if a person has angina or arrhythmias, person's had a history of myocardial infarction or stroke, drug's probably not for them. On the other hand, we have the DHE, dihydro or gotamine preparations. They're also available as generics and sometimes in fixed dose with caffeine. Those drugs seem to have a significant effect on some people. Now, the small oral CG receptor antagonists, the story started a long time ago. And actually, Merck was doing a study on telcacapant. And the initial reports were pretty glowing that it was going to be effective. But unfortunately, in 2011, Merck took the drug off of the study, off the market. It wasn't, hadn't gotten to FDA approval status yet but they found too much liver toxicity. So other reports have evaluated some of these drugs and they see that, well, yeah, the drug has an risk, has a, has a point in the acute treatment of migraine headaches, 
But the differences between the Ubrelvi and the placebo might be magnified by the large numbers of people who are in the study. So being statistically significant isn't necessarily the same thing as being clinically significant. So sometimes you look at drugs and you say, what's the number necessary to treat? The NNT, it's called. And the NNT gives you an idea about how many people you have to treat to benefit one person. So with Ubrelvi, at either 50 or 100 milligrams, it would appear you have to treat somewhere around 13 to 14 people to improve one person. Now, in the literature, it would suggest that with acetaminophen, you have to treat about 12 and a half people to get improvement in one, with aspirin, about eight people to get improvement in one, with imitrex, about six people to get improvement in one, and with maxalt, maybe only three people to get improvement in one. Mm, something, again, to be considered. So now they're currently looking at perhaps using Ubrelvi in combination with Amavig or Amgality, those other medicines that work on the CGRP. Looks like the medicine was actually discovered by Merck and licensed to Allergan. How much does the medicine cost? Well, you could buy 10 tablets of 50 milligram Ubrelvi, cash about $1,000, coupon about $850, get the coupon from GoodRx. So that means that the price per pill would be somewhere between $85 and $100. Now the company has some copay assistance and the copay assistance can reduce the cost out of pocket, but that doesn't change the amount of money that your insurance company is going to have to pay for the money, pay for the drug. And then of course, when you complain about your premium the next year, you have some idea why. Now, on the other hand, how much would Imitrex cost? You could get nine Imitrex pills at 100 milligrams. Mm, with a coupon from GoodRx, it would be somewhere between 11 and $22. Unless you happen to go to Walgreens, where it's $77. So basically, for less than $2 a pill, you could get some Imitrex. And the Imitrex works very well. Imitex is a good drug. So, yes, indeed, Ubrelvi is a new treatment for migraine. Yes, indeed, it works for some people who have that acute migraine, not for prevention of the migraine. doesn't matter whether you have the aura or don't have the aura. Studies show that it doesn't really demonstrate a phenomenal success. Drugs are really expensive. So it doesn't appear to be a home run for most people who are suffering from migraine. That's no matter how much hyper advertising goes into promotion of the drug. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.